Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I give thanks to my God in heaven for the faith given to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. It has become fashionable and even commonplace to think that our lives as Christians, as children of the Heavenly Father, as followers of Jesus, will be without turmoil, without trouble, without pain or suffering, without temptation or even difficulty. I think in some respects, sadly, the culture of our society feeds into this. The charismatic side of the Christian church that would say, if you just follow Jesus, everything will be good. I'm asked always, and I have been since I became a pastor, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Why does God allow bad things to happen to his children? Because the truth of the matter is that bad things are not for good or bad people. Bad things are a result of sin and a result that affects all, both those who are faithful to Christ and those who are not. But I would say that the measure of assault that is given to Christians is quite higher than that to those who do not know Christ or follow him. Being a follower of Jesus marks us and sets us kind of as a target so that Satan could draw his eyes upon us and separate us from our relationship to Jesus, causing us to doubt his mercy, his love, his compassion, and sometimes even his own real existence. This was very true even for Jesus. You see, in the New Testament, Jesus preached to his audience. When he spoke to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Jesus spoke to them about repentance and contrition, humility and love. You see, for the Sadducees and the Pharisees, self-righteousness and lawness was what it was all about for them. They believed that if they could just adhere to the rituals, the ceremonies, to the laws of the land and the Bible, that they could achieve perfection. They were very hypocritical in what they said and what they did. And so as Jesus spoke to them, he spoke to them about humility and repentance. Here today, in the gospel lesson, we see Jesus speaking to those who followed him to those who knew him and those who loved him. Jesus is preaching to those who are children, children of his and of the heavenly fathers. There were people there in the crowd listening to Jesus who desired to follow him. We know this throughout the scriptures because the Bible tells us that everywhere Jesus went, large crowds gathered to hear what he had to say to see his power and might, to watch him heal people, and for him to tell parables and stories. Many of the crowds where Jesus was were filled with zealous people for Christ, zealous people to become disciples of Jesus and followers of his. And so, much like when Jesus preached to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he preached to them what they needed to hear, so also in the text for today, Jesus preaches to the zealous Christians, to those who would seek to be followers of him, those who would seek to serve him and to be his disciples. Jesus begins his discourse with, to these zealous hearers, these words from St. Luke's gospel. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, and brother and sister, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now this is to a crowd of people that wanted to hear good things from Jesus. They wanted to see him heal the sick, to make the blind see again, the lame walk. These were the people that knew who Jesus was by what he did. And now he hits them with this line. 
You must hate your father, mother, your wife, and even your own life if you want to follow me. You see, Jesus is reminding them, as he is to you and to me, that the first commandment is true. You shall have no other gods but me. You see, often in our lives, we put many things above our relationship to Jesus. Our children, our spouse, our mother, our father, our dogs. You can put anything in the category. But oftentimes for people, we find things to substitute for the most important things in our life, namely our Lord and Savior. You see, the violation of the first commandment occurs truly at every turn in the Ten Commandments. My pastor used to teach us in confirmation, if you have violated any of the commandments, you have also violated the first, no matter what the commandment is. Because placing anything above God is a sin. Even your own self in that matter. Jesus continues in the discourse by saying these words. For which of you deserving or desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete the task? This is a reality in my recent life. Before we built the new high school or began the new high school for Peters Township, we spent almost two years counting the cost. And oh, by the way, we still miss things. You see, we spent time calculating how much this or that, this different finish or that different finish, would play into this overall picture. How much counting the cost, because after all, counting the cost allows you to prepare for those difficult times down the road. In fact, in this high school project, we have a contingency fund of almost $2 million for those things that we missed or forgot or miscalculated or underestimated. And so the Bible is clear that if you don't prepare knowing what the potential cost is, you will be taken off guard. And I have to tell you, the same thing applies to your life as a Christian. Very, very often, in fact, this week, Pastor Schmidt and I have an interview for a, a young man who wants to go to the seminary, which I do quite often as district president. And I, I love to ask the question to these prospective men going into the seminary, do you really know what you're getting yourself into? Do you really understand that your people will love you and at the same time be angry with you? Because you have to say things to them that might be offensive or hurtful. It might call them on account of their behavior. You might have to tell them to stop sinning, which makes you the evil empire. But there is also those times when you have the privilege and the joy of extending forgiveness. Where you can tell your people that God through his son Jesus Christ has died for you and forgiven this specific sin that you now confess, which is a great day. Have you counted the cost and know that pastors work more than just one hour on Sunday? Do you understand that servants of the church are always under attack by Satan because if he can take away the messenger, then the rest of those that hear would be easy to follow? Are these the things that you count before you desire to go into service to God in the church? And oftentimes the answers that we get when I do these interviews is no. I didn't realize it was going to be like that. You see, recruit, recruiters for the seminary don't talk about that stuff because it would hinder recruitment. You know, my pastor told me when I was at seminary and when we first got married, Pastor Fisher told me, he called me Jim. I don't think he ever knew my name. He said, that's your name before you get to heaven. He said, Jim, he said, you know, your people will talk about you every single day. Some good, some not so good. But they will always talk about you. And he said, if you're a good pastor and you do your work, that's the way it should be. Because if you're visiting God's people, if you're teaching, if you're preaching, if you're delivering the sacraments, that is the life of a servant. He also said you'll lose your first name and you'll become pastor. It's the truth. 
Counting the cost of being a child of God is something that many Christians refuse to do. You have a target on your back. And now Satan wants to destroy your relationship with Jesus. You see, even Jesus himself knew the costs. We know that throughout the whole of the New Testament. We know that on Monday, Thursday, when he bent the knee in the Garden of Gethsemane and asked his father to change the course of the events of the next couple days. Jesus knew the cost. He knew that his life would be demanded in your place. He knew that you would be forgiven by his death and resurrection. As Pastor Schmidt told the young ones this day, the hardest work of all was done by the loving Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, who knew what was required of him. He knew the burden that he bore, and he knew that the burden he bore would free you from any burden, and that salvation and forgiveness would be yours without cost and without payment, so that you would enjoy the simple words that say, you are forgiven, go my child, and sin no more. These are the words Jesus spoke in the New Testament. At every turn, whenever he healed, forgave, made well, made walk, get up, take your mat, go, and sin no more. You are forgiven. Your faith has made you well. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus was prepared. Jesus was ready. Jesus was willing. And Jesus, in some respects, was very saddened on that Good Friday when he looked out into the crowd and he had to have seen the very people that were cheering for him only one week earlier, calling him the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who now through selfish desire and satanic influence would call for his life, an innocent man for guilty people. And yet, he knew the cost. And he paid it for you. And for me. We forget as Christians that our lives in faith are lives of mercy by God. Mercy that is shown to his people. Love that is given to his children. I mean, I, I sometimes wonder how God can put up with us. And I'm in that category, by the way. The repetition of our sinfulness the repetition of our pet sins that we fall prey to. And yet we're reminded in the scriptures always that it is through the blood of Christ that we have forgiveness. It is not through the works of our hands. It is not through the desire of our hearts, but through the mercy that comes only by the Father in heaven through the gift of his Son. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the cost has been counted. The fee has been paid. The work has been done, and you, children of the Heavenly Father, have been forgiven. Rejoice and be glad, for the good news is yours. It is yours by right as children of the Heavenly Father. Right that we've been promised by the Father. And through faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you inherit the gift which was given those many years ago on the cross by Jesus, the Son of God. In his great mercy and in his love, he saw fit, knowing the cost, to pay it for you. Rejoice with me in that great news this day as we say amen. May God the Father who gives us the great gift of his Son, may God the Son who gives us his life and death, and may God the Holy Spirit continue to bless, guide, lead, and strengthen you this day, now and forevermore. Amen.